was it about our Lord mentioning a widow from Zarephath and Naaman the Syrian that caused such anger, rage, and wrath to form from an otherwise loving, accommodating, and calm Jewish audience in the synagogue? Because the people you read about in 28 and 29 were the same people in verse 22. I said last week, good preaching brings to surface what's there. Some of you, you love the preacher as long as his preaching agrees with you. And he preach what you like. The moment we preach what God says, and then this particular part of what God says is something that you don't like. In many cases, people hear a spirit saying, your season is up. God has told me to do something else. Simply because... The Lord said something. Not that it was wrong. Not that it was incorrect or inaccurate. Or non-scriptural. But you just didn't like it. So, I'm moving on. Again, these people loved his words. They were gracious they were kind. They were accommodating. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And after he read it, these things he gave the scroll to the Kazan. King James says the minister. And the Lord sat down and he taught and they loved it. But then he did something that they did not like. And, and ministers will tell you that we run into this today. People like for you to recognize some folk. But they don't want you to recognize others. They want to be able to, con to control that. Sometimes we like it when we hear a preacher preaching against sin that doesn't affect us. We'll scream, you're preaching now! <laughs> but when it's sin that hit us, all of a sudden, the kidneys go to get active and uh, body language changes and all kinds of things happen. We get stingy with our amens as though that really matter one way or the other. Before we deal with what our Lord said and, and uh, deal with the answer to this, let's look at the second example. Or the second story that our Lord gives. And when he mentions, mentioned Elisha, as well as mentioning Elijah, when he mentioned the widow of Sarepta or Naaman the Syrian, the Lord knew that his audience was well aware of their history. So they knew what he was talking about. Let's look at this story, the story of Naaman 
and the prophet Elijah during the time of Elisha. Elisha, which means, or Elisha, God is salvation. This prophet was, had, a, had a, a prophetic ministry that lasted approximately 50 years. During 850 to 800 B.C., he preached and ministered. Our Lord mentions and our text deals with arguably the most significant event that took place in this farmer turned prophet life. You know, Elisha was a wealthy farmer. When Elijah called him, Elisha was in the field, according to 1 Kings chapter 19. Says, so he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Saphath, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he with the 12th. Elijah passed by and cast his mantle upon him. Elisha was the twelfth pair of oxen with 11 ahead of him. He owned them all, which showed that his family was wealthy. As he was plowing, the prophet Elijah took his cloak, took his mantle, and the cloak was the most important article of clothing uh, in those times. The cloak could be used as a protection against the weather when it was cold, as a seat to sit down on, as luggage to carry one's uh, bag. Uh, the cloak had multiple um, functions. And another way that the cloak was used was to transfer authority. When Elijah was taken up, he threw his mantle back. Elisha picked up his mantle, according to 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11 through 14, and struck the waters with his pastor's mantle, and the waters divided. On this fateful day, Elisha was farming, and Elijah the prophet walked up to him and put his mantle on him, which meant that Elisha was chosen to be his successor. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he, Elijah, said unto him, Go back again, for what have I, to, what have I done to thee? He says, If you got to go and do all that, go on back. I don't have anything to do with you. The call of God is something. And he returned back from him. Look at this. And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew and bore their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave it to the people and they did eat. What happened? Instead of going back to kiss his father goodbye, to kiss his parents goodbye, he went back and took the yoke of oxen that he was plowing with and sacrificed them and gave the yoke of oxen to the men who were with him for them to have a feast, which meant he had shifted his career. He, he could not go, he could not continue to plow without his oxen. He gave up his career to follow the man of God. And, and, and to, to make sure it was given up, he celebrated giving up his career by dining and having a feast and said, now I'm going to follow God. 
So Elisha follows Elijah and became his apprentice. And uh, by the time our Lord mentions him, he's now in his own ministry. Elijah is taken up in a fiery chariot and Elisha is God's man. Elisha celebrated being chosen to serve. Hallelujah. He realized that it was an honor for Elijah to put the mantle on, upon his shoulders. Isn't that something? This bald, and he was bald, according to 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 23, which is interesting because Elijah was a hairy man. His apprentice was Baal. This apprentice of Elijah was the second example that our Lord gave of him using the Gentiles and for the Gentiles uh, to be blessed by God, which was the answer to the question, why did the Jews get mad? They got mad because the Lord decided to use people that the, gen that the Jews didn't think were usable. Amen. Be careful how you write people off. You're not God. You're not God. You can't determine who the Lord can use and who the Lord can't use. Even the person who's out there lost right now, the Lord knows how to bring people in. Amen. When Paul was in jail, he told Timothy, Come quickly and bring the parchments, bring my cloak, and, uh, and by the way, get Mark. Mark had been on the outs. Get Mark because he is profitable unto me for the ministry. You just, you never know who the Lord may choose. Are you with me? It will get better as I lay this foundation the expositor said this, says, the latter days of the reign of Israel's king, Jehoram. Now I want to call your attention to 1 Kings. I want to show you something. We're going to study uh, and see what took place actually in 2 Kings, excuse me, chapter 5. Because this records our text when the Lord talked about Naaman. The latter days of the reign of Israel's King Jehoram were marked by hostilities with the Armenian king, King Ben-Hadad II, probably due to Israel's failure to participate in the continued Saro a Syrian confrontation that marked most of six decades of the ninth century BC. Israel and Ben-Hadad constantly stayed in a fight because Israel wouldn't join Ben-Hadad in the Assyrians' attempt to destroy the Syrians. So since the northern kingdom would not link up with Ben-Hadad, the king of the Assyrians, against the Syrians. There was constant conflict between Israel and the Assyrians. The Assyrians would send systematic raids into the northern kingdom, which is Israel. And these raids would go in and plunder and kill, and they would withdraw. Yeah, yeah. On one such raid, an Israeli maiden, a young girl, was taken captive. And when the Assyrian girl captured this maid, the Syrians, excuse me, they took the maid and gave her to um, Naaman to be his wife's 
slave. All right? I need to lay this foundation. So, Ben-Hadad was fighting against Israel. Global conflict was going on between nations, similar to what we see today. Chapter 2, chapter 5, excuse me, of 2 Kings, began with verse 1, says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master. And honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. Ben Hadad was actually king of Syria, not of Assyria. So Naaman was his fighter, and the Lord had used Naaman to give deliverance to Syria. And Naaman, the Bible says, he was also a mighty man. In valor, but he was a leper. Hence, my subtopic the magnificence and the malady. Butler mentions five things that speaks to the magnificence of Naaman the Syrian. And those five things I've just read to you in verse 1. Number one, they are his position. Second, his preference. Third, praise. Fourth, performance. And lastly, his prowess. We are told of his position. The Bible says in verse 1, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Assyria. He was what today would be called the captain of the joint chiefs of staff. Naaman was a mighty, powerful military leader. The word host there means army. So his position was he was the head of the joint chiefs. Naaman was the general of generals. Notice his preference. The Bible says he was a great man with his master. Notice he had favor with King Ben-Hadad of Syria. And this was not automatic because many times the military strong man and the king were at odds because many times it was the military who would conquer the government and take over the government. But uh, Naaman and Ben-Hadad had a wonderful relationship. So he had a powerful position. He had preference with the king. And notice this. The Bible says, and he was honorable. He had praise. He's, he was respected by the king. And he was respected by the people. The king praised him. The people praised him. And notice what the Bible says about his performance. It says, because the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. God had used this man to gain victory for Syria. And lastly, concerning his magnificence, the Bible mentions that he was a mighty man in valor. Uh, Naaman could fight. He was a soldier of superior skill. So the praise that went to him was not empty praise. He was an achiever. He could fight. He had power. He had position. He had authority. He was a magnificent man. Everybody say amen. amen. A magnificent man, but for all of his magnificence he had a malady and the malady that he had threatened all of his magnificence there was something wrong with him that had the potential to erase everything 
that made him great. His malady was that he was a leper. Isn't that something? Naaman's magnificence was great, but he was, my friends, a leper. Now, if you read this uh, in the Hebrew, the Hebrew is stronger than the English. Because if you notice in your Bible, you see in italicized writings, it says, but he was. Do you see that? It's italicized, which means that that was not a part of the original Hebrew text, but that was added by the translators for clarity. But he was. In the Hebrew, the but he was is taken out, and it just simply says uh, all of those other things, captain of the host of Syria, a great man with his master, honorable because the Lord had given him deliverance. He was uh, mighty in valor. Then it says a leper, which, which means that no matter what all of those wonderful things were, the fact that he was a leper canceled out all of that. It ruined everything else. He was this, 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 this. Oh, by the way, did I tell you that he's a leper? Which automatically takes everything else off the table. Are you with me? It is said that a slave, even the basest slave, the most beset slave, would not have traded places with Naaman would not have traded skin with Naaman even if all of the other accolades of Naaman came with the trade. The most basest slave would rather remain a slave with his regular skin than to be Naaman and be a leper. Praise the Lord. Matthew Henry quotes Bishop Hall he says, leprosy was a defiling, disfiguring, dead, deadening, disassociating, and deadly disease. A look at the characteristics and one will quickly see why Naaman's malady canceled out all of his magnificence. And what leprosy does to one physically is what sin does. To a person morally and spiritually. Sin can bring the best preacher down. Sin can destroy the best singer. Sin can cancel out all of the good things that a politician did during his or her reign. Sin can mess it all up. You're not with me today. It says that, uh, Henry says that leprosy was defiling. A leper was considered unclean. According to the law, a leper had to cry out, unclean, unclean, to warn people of their presence. So if one had leprosy, one was defiled. The leper lacked purity. Leprosy was disfiguring. Leprosy can become greatly disfiguring over time. Leprosy would, would change Naaman from an attractive army official to an ugly, repulsive, unwanted person. And he knew it. That if this condition continued, he'd go from being the good-looking Adonis that he was to being a grotesque looking man, who may be missing lips, or his nose, or his ears may have rotted off, or hands become greatly defiled as that disease caused his body to literally rot away. It was defiling, it was disfiguring, leprosy destroys 
like sin does. Sin makes the prettiest person ugly. Sin, you've seen folk after sin was finished. You've gone back to family reunions and, and, and high school reunions and you've witnessed what sin have done to people. We've seen what con sin conditions uh, do to people who are in sin. It destroys them. The lips turn black. The gums are messed up. Pre they they uh, recede prematurely from smoking. Hands get all messed up. Sin. A person on meth, you can tell it. The drug addict can't hide his or her addiction but for so long. Immoral, sexually transmitted disease, sin takes its toll on a person. That's why the Bible says, that's why you have to, we have to, you have to forsake sin. The Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. I must be preaching to a Presbyterian church today. Oh my. And I tell you, nobody wins. Okay, how good you think you look today. Two things are undefeated. Sin and Father Time. Time takes its toll on everybody. Sin takes its toll on everybody. You, you know, the Marlboro Man was one cool looking fellow. Amen. Amen. Riding that horse with that cowboy hat on. But before the Marlboro man died, he let, he let the people on the other side take a picture of him to show the people what years of smoking Marlboros had done to his body. Sin will destroy you. Not only uh, is sin all of these other things, but leprosy was deadening. The lepers uh, would, uh, would go numb in their feelings. Many lepers have been known to have their fingers and toes eaten off as they slept through the night by rats and other rodents because they lost the ability to feel. And they wake up the next day and their fingers are gone or their toes are gone or an earlobe is missing. Why? Because uh, the rodent in the night consumed, chewed their flesh, their bodies, their fingers away. Sin is like leprosy. It destroys feelings. Sin hardens the heart. Thank you for watching God First with Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. and the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. To experience this message in its entirety, call 877-463-3477 to purchase a DVD or CD. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day. God First.